-hmm. Trying to connect. So yeah, I think we're live now. Perfect. <clears throat> so I will quickly introduce you. <laughs> so today we're listening to a talk by Tyler Carrier. And I must say, I'm really thankful, uh, Tyler, for your patience. Took me a while to like figure out all, how this works again with Zoom and then connecting to YouTube live streaming through micro seminar because we haven't been doing it in a while. But we have actually been waiting for a while for your talk. We were really excited when you signed up to give your talk on the spread of microbes that manipulate reproduction in marine invertebrates. And the stage is all yours. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me and being patient on my side, because I think we originally agreed six months ago and I wanted to hold off for a little bit. Um, so I'm glad it all came together. Um, so if we look at systems where um, people study animal microbe symbiosis, they can really be divided into, I guess, two camps. Um, the first are those that have guts and often, not all the time, they also have fairly diverse microbial communities. The other camp or uh, type are systems or animals that, that don't have a gut. And in both situations, they have really important symbioses, but they're often talked about in a little bit of a different context. Um, when we think about the gut microbiome, humans or model systems come up uh, quite often and having broad implications for host biology. And while that's definitely true for the, the systems without a gut, um, they're often talked about um, a little different. Um, so one question that I had, um, you know, what are the consequences to the microbiome when the gut is lost? So what if you went from this side to this side? Um, how does the microbiome change? Um, so I'm an invertebrate biologist. I primarily study the developmental stages of marine invertebrates. And this idea of gut versus not gut is actually not that foreign. Um, so there's two main types of larvae. The first one is planktotrophy or a, a reproductive strategy. And in planktotrophy, the, the adult, the mom, um, produces as many eggs or just about as many eggs as possible. And in each of those, they provide minimal maternal investment. And that egg doesn't have enough energy to progress all the way through development. So it needs to find food. Um, and these feeding larvae have been um, studied in, in a symbiosis context for a bit. Um, they're known to have complex communities, primarily being in the gut. And they're studied from, from an ecological context. Um, so here we have a sea urchin larva that is um, well-fed. Um, it had lived in a environment where food was quite abundant. Um, it has a big stomach, it has short feeding arms, and then it has this juvenile rudiment. Uh, and if, if this larva isn't provided a lot of food, it actually has a different phenotype. So as you can see, that, that rudiment is no longer there. The, the um, early stage juvenile, which is inside of the larva, um, the stomach is much, much smaller. And these arms are actually longer. Um, and, and what that allows the larva to do is in a low food environment, it can actually increase its ability to feed relative to um, what's, in, what's in the water. On a microbial level, if we um, take a bunch of, bunch of these, in this case, sea urchin larvae, and provide them with, say, four different diets going from high uh, to low, um, at the early stages of differential feeding or their exposure to, to different environments, they have a common community. No matter what diet that they're fed, they have a similar uh, taxonomic and compositional makeup. Um, a little bit later, that community differentiates so that, so that it is diet specific. And then the three lower diets or the, any bit of starvation or diet restriction, those microbial profiles converge and 
they are, they are different from the larvae that are well fed. And at this point, there has been no morphological plasticity. So they still reflect that we call a phenotype. And then a little bit later, you have the same microbial profile or relationship, and then the larvae express plasticity. So the larvae have longer arms and smaller stomachs. Now, the second type of um, or reproductive strategy of marine invertebrates is lecithotrophy. And in this, the larvae look much different. So instead of having this really elaborate morphology for feeding and swimming, they have really simple morphologies. So they often um, look like potatoes um, and they're just filled with lipids. And these larvae are often, um, there's often a few thousand of them instead of upwards of a, a million or a couple million. And they have much more maternal investment and they spend much less time um, in the water column because they no longer need to find food. In the uh, 80s and 90s, people began to uh, build sort of elaborate phylogenies to see if there were any um, specific points where, um, where, where there, there were changes in these developmental modes. And what people found was that there were speciation events that coincided with a, this, this change in reproductive strategy. And um, since the 90s, people have been trying to figure out why this happens. Now, from a, um, a, a life history perspective, the best system that has been studied is Heliosideris. It is a genus um, found off the coast of Australia, a little bit in New Zealand and um, Japan. And there is two species that are in the same waters, in the same tide pool even, that have these two de developmental strategies. There is Heliosideris tuberculata, which is the planktotroph, and there is Heliosideris gramma, which is the lecithotroph. And typical of these two developmental strategies, tuberculata has a small egg, and the egg of erythrogramma is quite big. Um, by volume, this is roughly 100 times bigger. Um, tuberculata has these elaborate feeding arms. It has a three-part gut. Um, and while erythrogramma has no arms, and it also um, doesn't have a functional gut. Um, tuberculata is morphologically plastic, whereas this morphology is, is um, static for erythrogramma. So with these two species, there were two hypotheses that we were looking to test. Um, the first is when you go from feeding or having a functional gut to non-feeding or not having a functional gut, that the, the diversity of symbionts that you associate with um, decreases. And the second is that when you go from feeding to non-feeding or gut to not gut, um, that this ecological responsiveness is lost. Um, so in, I think, 2018 or so, I went down to Sydney to work with Maria Byrne and her PhD student, and now uh, Dr. Dion Deeker, um, and ran a um, differential feeding experiment um, going from high food to no food, and did it for both species. Um, because erythrogramma is in, in the water that long, we've... Um, we conducted this experiment for five days and sampled daily. And um, we conducted this experiment with tuberculata for 20 days, which is much of its um, planktonic period, and sampled them every five days. And then we did, I guess, now fairly standard amplicon sequencing. So um, what we saw on a community level that was expected for um, microbiomes is that there was this very strong species profile and that this community differed from um, the water. If you look at now alpha diversity, um, we, we, we observed that the species with a functional gut had a community that was roughly three times as diverse as the one without it. Um, and that was consistent for total ASVs as well as for phylogenetic diversity. Now we also did um, qPCR 
and to, to try to quantify the number of 16S copies in these communities. And uh, the profile for the community for the, the, the larva with a gut what had roughly 13 times more microbial cells or 16S copies as the non-feeder. So there is both a reduction in um, community diversity as well as um, cell abundance. Now, if we just look at these, these two species and um, compare their, their communities at all these different time points, um, what we saw for tuberculata um, was that it was a very typical response for these other planktotrophs that um, we've seen, where you started at a sort of common community, and then there's a shift in the microbiome, and then that profile matches up with the other phenotype. So there's this sort of phenotypic shift um, or co-shift between the phenotype and the microbiome. If we now look at this for erythrogramma, um, we saw that there was no diet specificity and that there, um, but there was a strong temporal response. So that sort of supported our, our second hypothesis. Now we were looking at the taxonomic profiles of these communities and having looked at a few of these for various urchin larvae, um, there was one, one uh, time point and um, uh, feeding um, combination that, that, that stuck out. Um, most profiles, both for these species and for other three conoderms have a, a few main uh, dominant phyla. Um, but, but for, um, for here, we saw, we noticed that one was absolutely dominated by, um, what turned out to be, um, a proteobacteria. And this was the eggs of the, um, the, the non-feeding larvae or the one that, uh, didn't, doesn't have a gut. And when we were looking at that profile, we noticed that it represented, um, bacteria that represented 95% of the community, and it was only rent, uh, represented by one ASV, um, which is compared to usually a, a couple hundred. When we were trying to, when we were looking at um, the, the um, what 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 tax of this this bacterium came from, um, we got two results um, through blast. The first was that it was an uncultured bacteria, um, which is quite common for some of these communities. And the second answer, which were split about 50-50 was Wolbachia. And um, as someone who studies symbiosis, I was a little familiar with Wolbachia and I knew a couple things about it. Um, the first was that it's really important to <laughs> developmental biology and reproductive biology. And the second was that it's, a it's predominantly or almost exclusively terrestrial. So, um, at a, um, at, a, at a meeting back in 2018, I was talking, or 2019 actually, I was talking to a colleague and friend, Brittany Lee, um, about this, who has a background in um, marine symbiosis, but was also working in a Wabakia lab. And um, we, we agreed that it'd be it, it, uh, really important to try to figure out what the phylogenetic position of this bacterium was. So we did a metagenome for the eggs of this um, sea urchin, and we got super lucky that within two weeks of getting our metagenomic sequences back, there was a draft genome for the host by a, um, an, a, a different lab um, with no communication before. So we were really lucky that they um, provided us, that they allowed us access to those so that we could get rid of the host and just look at the um, bacteria. And we got one 16S sequence, which is right here. And we compared this to a bunch of other um, genera within um, Rickettsiales, as well as 20 of the top hits on NCBI. And this bacterium, which we called Lucano Rickettsia raffii, um, was most closely related um, based on sequence similarity with Wolbachia and a group within the Anaplasiae. Um, we then compared full genomes to, uh, um, with a few 
um, or with, with, with the, the primary uh, genera within Anaplasia and found that there were 50 core genes. And when we use those to make a phylogenetic comparison, um, saw that, the, that this bacterium was still most closely related to um, Wolbachia. Um, and interestingly, there was a few hundred genes that um, were not found in any of these other, other genomes. Um, one of the genes that was not found in um, some of the relatives um, were for um, flagellar biosynthesis. So as far as we're aware, um, that within a group of obligate symbionts, this bacterium could have the ability to not be obligate. Um, and we noticed a couple other gene groups that we found to be quite um, intriguing. Um, the first was that it appears that this bacterium may have a nutritional interaction with the host. Um, and it's through um, or by um, diacetylglycerol catabolism so that, that, that the um, bacterium uses lipids for, um, for metabolism. And these diacetylglycerols aren't just a random lipid. Um, when you go from having a small egg to a big egg, the, the big reason is an increase in lipids. And the lipid for that is um, diacetylglycerols. So all of these dots in here are diacetylglycerols. Um, in the second, um, is that appears this bacterium can synthesize um, some essential amino acids, the shikimate pathway, so tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine. Um, so there could be some uh, nutritional cooperation going on. And the second was that um, it appears this bacterium could, um, as, as we're phrasing it, have some sort of selfish behaviors. Um, there was a uh, type four secretion system and um, there, we, there was predicted to be 80 or so um, um, proteins that were excreted. Um, three of those had eukaryotic-like domains on them. Two of those were anchorins, um, which are known to interact with, um, with the host. And one of those had a domain for, that was homologous to a, ma a male killing gene. And that third one um, was a, had a synaptobrevin domain on it. And interestingly, synaptobrevin is a gene that's, that's involved in fertilization um, in sea urchins. So we think that this bacterium could sort of uh, could have a nutritional interaction while also exhibiting some selfish behaviors. So now the question is, um, is this thing vertically transmitted like a lot of these other what we, potential reproductive manipulators or endosymbionts? Um, and if we look at the early or at the egg, um, is they it's, as I mentioned before, 95% of the sequences. And then after that, there is a sharp uh, decline in the, the relative abundance of this bacteria. Now, this could be because of an, an increase in environmental microbes, or it could be a decrease in this bacteria. So we did qPCR and, and estimate that the egg has 34,000 cells or so of this bacterium, and that the embryos just a couple of days later have 300 or so. So there's an over 100 uh, fold decrease in, in just a couple of days. We also did fish on the eggs because they're, they, these, this bacterium was so abundant in, in the egg. And we can see that it is um, spread throughout um, the egg. And they're specifically between those lipid droplets. Um, we, because this was in the egg, we assumed that it is vertically transmitted. So we also did PCR on the ovaries and found that this bacterium um, was in there. And we do know that, or realize that this signal is a little weak. The, the ovaries samples were taken after spawning because of um, multiple labs, actually in this case, the, the other lab that had the, that gave us access to the genome um, went down or was, was at, or was in Sydney at the time and they were spawning embryos for their experiments and then we get the ovaries after. So it would be expected that this signal would be um, a little weak. 
Now, if, if this is a reproductive manipulator and if it is vertically transmitted, one expectation would be that the population would be female dominant. So we sampled um, in Sydney Harbor at the at two sites, um, the Opera House is I believe somewhere over here. Um, and we sampled a few hundred individuals. And what we saw was that there was two thirds of those were female. And if we then broke that up by size, which is a proxy for age, um, we saw that the youngest reproductive individuals um, had a one-to-one one sex ratio, and then that became female dominant um, in the biggest size fraction that we were able to find. Um, this final number being a four to one ratio between females and males. So if this is a reproductive manipulation, a big question uh, at the end of this was how, how would this work? Um, currently, um, all other reproductive manipulators are on land and the reproductive strategies of ter those terrestrials are much, much different than those in the ocean. Um, so a lot of marine invertebrates will free spawn their gametes. They will release their eggs and sperm into the water um, while a lot of terrestrial systems uh, need physical contact. Um, so we, what, the next thing that we decided to do was take um, population models for Wolbachia or other reproductive manipulators and um, merge that or integrate it with um, uh, fertilization models and zygote production models for marine invertebrates. Um, so for this, um, Matt Kustra and I worked together. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we took a fertilization polyspermy model and a zygote production model um, and combine that with um, models that look at reproductive manipulation and, and specifically um, cytoplasmic incompatibility, feminization, and male kill. So first to look at um, sort of the, what the um, fertilization dynamics for a marine invertebrate looks like over um, population density, as well as across a bunch of sex ratios going from uh, male dominant to female dominant. And what we see in tuberculata here is typical of what we see for planktotrophs. As you increase population density, there's a general increase in fertilization success to some local maxima. And then after that, the fertilization percentage decreases um, due to polyspermy. And if we then compare that, that those, those maxima across sex ratios, when you go from being male dominant to female dominant, there's a decrease in fertilization success. Now this, this relationship was much, much different in erythrogramma. There was that same general shape with density, but across sex ratios, there was no decrease. Um, they actually just shifted towards a, a denser population. Now, if we then look at zygote production, one consequence of this or result of this is that when you go from a male dominant population towards a female dominant population, there is an increase in zygote production to a certain level, and then there is a substantial decrease. But in erythrogramma, there wasn't that decrease because population or the, the, because fertilization success um, didn't decrease. So there's actually just a continual increase. So there's, a, there's another way to view this. Um, so here we have tuberculata and on this, the X axis, we have sex ratio and Y axis, we have fertilization uh, percentage. And here we're just looking at the maximum fertilization percentage for um, each sex ratio. And going from a complete male population to female population, there is a um, continual decrease um, once you reach about 0.75. Um, through towards a all-female population. And if you look at the, the zygote density for that, or zygote production, there is a uh, increase up until um, a little bit past a one-to-one, -one, so you become slightly female dominant. And then after that, there is a sharp decrease in zygote production. And that is due to a sperm limitation. 
Now, if you look at this for erythrogramma, um, there is a continuation or there is a, there is a, a consistent 100% um, maxima from one all the way until right before zero. Um, and the result of that is that there's just this exponential increase in zygote production um, as you go from a male population to a female population. Now, if you look at what type of um, reproductive manip manipulation could result in, in these uh, sex ratio changes, um, when we look at cytoplasmic incompatibility, which doesn't change the sex ratio, um, there, it, 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 it can definitely spread within a population of free spawning marine vertebrates. It spreads quicker for uh, tuberculata than it does for erythrogramma, and that's a result of um, the, the, the fecundity difference or the number of eggs that are produced. Um, feminization also spreads quicker in tuberculata than erythrogramma, but with it, you can ch change the sex ratio. And for male killing, um, it does not spread. Um, and because it doesn't spread, it also doesn't change the sex ratio. Now here for male killing um, or in terrestrial systems for male killing, there has to be some type of fitness compensation. And that fitness compensation is often through cannibalism. And for marine systems where their, their larvae disperse um, up to a hundred kilometers or so, and where um, sibling larvae never meet, um, this cannibalism or this type of fitness compensation um, seems very unlikely. But what could be possible is that this symbiont could provide some growth factors, some say essential amino acids to the host that could compensate for um, killing off um, a portion of, of the total clutch. So that was what we, we then did. We made a population a structured model for three different size classes that, um, for which we sampled before. And when you just look at enhanced growth, the smallest individuals are um, very male dominant. And then as, as, the, as the size of the animal increases or the age of the animal increases, that sex ratio um, comes, comes closer to a one-to-one. If you then um, add male killing to that, this whole relationship just shifts. So the smallest individuals are just slightly female dominant, and they become more female dominant with age. And if you add CI to that, um, you just reach fixation quicker. Now, um, the, the, these two life history combinations um, they represent these sort of the extremes. And um, one question that we had are, you know, what life history combinations could host reproductive manipulators and which couldn't. Um, so naturally, we looked at just about every combination based on two parameters. The first um, is the size of the egg. And the second is how long the larva is in the water, because those are the two dominant um, are two of the dominant life history characters of um, marine invertebrate reproduction. And when we do this, we saw a fairly strong difference between life history combinations that could or could not uh, be infected by a reproductive manipulator. And the, the general shape for these was quite similar. Um, so there is at, at a pladric larval duration or the time that the is that the larva spent in the water. Um, just about no species above 40 days, um, which for a larva is not that long, um, is unlikely to host one of these um, symbionts. Um, but th there, there didn't seem to be much of a restriction based on egg size. And this relationship um, just sort of increased um, or the, 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 the barrier to pladric larval duration increased um, for uh, male killing plus enhanced growth as opposed to feminization. Um, so we then took um, all the species that we, that, that we know of and that, um, that we're aware of for which 
um, we know the egg diameter and the pelagic larval duration for and mapped it onto these plots. And for feminization, 63% of species, which were a, a few hundred, um, fell within this infection window. Um, whereas for male you know, killing plus enhanced growth, 80% of species fell within this infection window. So quite a wide variety of life histories and species could potentially be infected by um, reproductive manipulators. Um, so one other layer to this was that um, in addition to um, simulating which like history combinations could be infected by reproductive manipulators, we can also look at how the population changed as a result of that. Was there a, an increase in population size or decrease largely based on zygote production? And when we map it onto this, um, with purple being a decrease in population and green being an increase in population, what we see for feminization is that a lot of a, a large area um, for where there are uh, small, smaller eggs, relatively smaller eggs and species that have um, longer pelagic larval durations, those species would are, are predicted to uh, have a decrease in population size, whereas species with um, that don't disperse as far and also have larger eggs um, should have a slight increase. Now in male killing, that window for where there is a population decrease is smaller um, and roughly around 250 to 300 microns onward, it, it'd be predicted that those like history combinations um, experience an, an increase in population size. And what's quite intriguing is that this area right here, um, which is where there is sort of no change in population size, that is where you change from going from a planktotroph to a lysithotroph. Um, so one question now is, you know, where are these two species that I've been talking about this whole time? Um, so tuberculata is actually right here. And then erythrogramma is down here. So tuberculata falls right in the middle of a um, very or, or an area where the population size should decrease quite a bit, whereas um, erythrogramma is in the area where the population should increase, which sort of fits this whole framework. So to summarize, um, there are sort of three steps that we think um, occur on a microbial level when going from species with a gut to without a gut. Um, first is that there's a loss in community diversity um, due to a loss in ecological responsiveness. You no longer respond to various abiotic or biotic pressures that previously influenced how the composition of the microbiome. The second is that there's a reduction in community diversity um, due to the loss in a functional gut. And then the third is um, the acquisition of a endosymbiont that could be involved in nutrition and or reproduction. The big question is where does this third one fall? And based on a lot of the simulations um, from the model, uh, from, from the model that Matt and I um, have is what would, would suggest that this three could actually be a one, that there is the incentives for a reproductive manipulator to change or to um, induce some developmental shift in, in the host in order to increase the egg size, minimize the amount of time that is spent in the water column. Um, so there's a bunch of um, stuff ongoing with this. We were, um, we, we have been incredibly fortunate that um, our, our collaborator, Maria in Sydney, was able to collect um, a bunch of more samples because we weren't able to go there because of health reasons. Um, so we're hoping to figure out exactly what this bacterium is doing during development and reproduction. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to go down and um, do some proper experiments. Um, so with that, there is many agencies to thank for funding and many, many people to thank um, for taking part of, in this work.
Thanks, Tyler. It was really fascinating. Um, <laughs> you want to tell us more about this photo? This photo? <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is, um, so I was out at Friday Harbor, which is on the West Coast of the U.S., um, and it was, it was a really, really pretty evening, and there's just one boat in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was a nice break from lab. Nice. Uh, I also want to encourage people who are watching. If you have any questions, you can post them directly into the YouTube channel, and I can read them out loud for you. Um, but I also have some questions piled up. So first, I was wondering when you showed the metabolic potential map of the Wolbachia. Did you reconstruct this actually from these eggs where you first found them with 16 s amplicon sequencing? And did you then manage to go in and actually reconstruct it from those eggs? Or how did you um, reconstruct this map? Yeah, so because it was from, um, so, so it represented 95% um, or so of the sequences in the eggs. So we thought it was easiest to work with the eggs. Um, yeah, so we um, sequenced all the DNA in the sea urchin eggs and then removed the, the host DNA um, through bioinformatics. Okay, that's really cool. I just wasn't sure if it was actually of the same samples. Yeah, no, it was, it was actually the, the exact samples um, that were used for Amplicon. Cool. And then I was wondering, so when you reconstructed it, did you maybe find any plasmids? So Brittany looked for that, um, and as far as I know, was not able to. Um, we use MySeq to actually make this genome, so we're not sure if it was it was deep enough or if um, if if there's actually anything there. Yeah. Okay. We still don't know if there might be one. Um, then I was also wondering um, when you showed it um, in that slide. You mentioned that it was a bit special to you that you actually find this um, fragellum. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know if you could elaborate a little bit why this is a special finding. Yeah, so um, all of the other anaplasiae are obligate symbionts. And one of the, um, easy, as, far as, as far as I'm aware, one of the easiest components of a bacterial genome to lose when you go from being free living to endosymbiont or to being an endosymbiont are the genes for flagellar biosynthesis. Um, so if this bacterium has all those genes and is within a group that are largely regarded as obligate symbionts, the first assumption is that it's probably not an obligate symbiont. Um, and living in the ocean, it, it's maybe strategic as from, from the bacterial perspective, if you're not an obligate symbiont to keep these because you probably have to swim around in the water at some point. Mm -hmm. So what we're thinking is sort of our running hypothesis is that when there is that decrease in abundance going from the egg to the embryos, that this bacterium is then shed out into the environment. Um, you came, through Amplicon, we did find it at very low abundances in the seawater. Mm -hmm. um, but what it then does and I mean, these two states, we have no idea. Interesting. And then about the host, I was wondering whether when you showed that there are two, these two different like life history strategies, either you have your uh, planktotrophic or you are less hypotrophic. Um, do you know if one of these states is like the more ancestral state? Oh, yeah, I missed that detail. Um, planktotrophy is ancestral. Okay. Um, and lecithotrophy, um, especially in, in this case, tends to evolve very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually happens over the course of a, a few million years. And is there like, like an evolutionary advantage to being lecithotrophic? Um, yes, there, yeah, there are. So, so that there's a lot of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest one often connects to mortality. The longer you're in the water column, the higher your mortality rate, which is one of the reasons to have more eggs. 
Um, so one advantage is that the mortality rate is much, much lower for the cithotrophs. So from a reproductive manipulator standpoint, having that mortality be reduced could be quite advantageous. Mm -hmm. And is this also more common in other sea urchin species? Um, I have not been able to find it or really um, any related rickettsia and any of the other sea urchins that I've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, we've looked through databases and we haven't been able to find something. A colleague here at GMR has made a, I think he's found every marine um, rickettsia mag or metagenome, assembled genome. And he put this into that um, big tree and it wasn't really closely related to anything. Okay. Which is very encouraging <laughs> because you're trying to figure out, you know, uh, the phylogenetic relation or ecological relationship with, with other microbes. And we haven't been able to do yet. Yeah. And I guess it would also be nice if you could go out and screen for these bugs in other hosts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Australia has some of the most diverse life histories amongst marine invertebrates in the world. Um, so it'd be cool just to sort of, sort of sample everything. Um, but that completely blinded approach, um, I'm not sure how strategic it is. Um, if these things only pop up at life history transitions, it'd be, I think, looking for those types of species could be really cool. Because if it's not very advantageous or not thought to be advantageous in planktotrophs, um, just looking in more planktotrophs may not be, um, it just may not pop up. Um, so maybe targeting some lecithotrophs. And there's also another reproductive strategy that I didn't even mention called brooding. Um, so looking at those as well. Um, but those aren't, those just aren't as common. How does brooding work? Um, often the embryo will either be in the adult or just attached to the surface. Um, so that pelagic larval duration becomes just about nothing. And the egg sizes are often quite big. Okay. It's almost like, um, parental care. There's an increase in parental care going from planktotrophy to the cithotrophy to um, brooding. Really cool. Yeah, that's all really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and there's actually one um, Heliosideris that just about broods. Mm -hmm. And it was a speciation event that happened after erythrocroma. Cool. So I think these were all the questions that I had. And so far, I don't have any in the chat. So I think I'm going to end the live stream. But just wanted to thank you one more time for taking the time and giving the talk here through MicroSeminar. Thank you very much for having me.